Welcome back to the Lantern Recycling Podcast. Ella here with Benji. As always, this show is supported by our show partner, Zwift. We've got two to Swift Stage 3 proper recap. A big man is back that we are excited about. We'll mention what happened on Stage 2 yesterday. Sorry for the lack of podcast. We weren't slacking. We had an unavoidable conflict we couldn't get out of that was important. We'll try not to do it again. We'll do our best. Uh, Mont Blanc 2 one-day race, big for points. There was a big battle there today, as well as mentioning Leo Hater craziness, the baby Chiro, uh, which I haven't seen any footage of, but I've heard a lot about because it wasn't live-streamed anywhere. But today's uh, – oh, no, sorry. Before we get into Stage 3, I mentioned yesterday in the Tour de Swiss Stage 2, it was like there's been a lot of these climby, sprinty boy stages that also offer the break a real chance of winning. Yesterday was no different. Yes, it was a flat – slash downhill run in the last 15 Ks, but there was five and a half Ks, six percent, three Ks, seven percent, and then six Ks, six percent. The the shall pass about 15 Ks from the finish. But yeah, what happened in that stage yesterday, Benji? Basically a pretty large breakaway, including the likes of Basso Witzdom, which is like a rider I think we spoke about this in Tour de Suisse last year, a national team of Switzerland coming here with riders that aren't able to come here with their own team. And that's one of those riders, Burgadol, Joel Sutter, Holmes, Batilati, Ruch, Leknesund, and Cher. That break, we actually ended up making it to the line, but not everyone. One rider rode away in the final section, and it's Andreas Leknesund of DSM, Norwegian guy. He's always been that time trial rider with climbing abilities, but not enough to break through as a stage racer on the level that he's riding on right now. And that time trial ability and his climbing ability brought him the opportunity to get away from the other breakaway riders in this race. He ended up actually getting a solid gap, but all the other breakaway riders that were lost, dropped by him, actually were caught by the peloton, so a sprint by the peloton for place two. But Leknesund comes over the line. He wins his uh, World Tour win right here. I'm pretty sure this is also his first World Tour win in total. Is his first pro win? Yeah, if you don't count it, I mean, are we counting the Norwegian ITT champs? Yes. It's his first, like, I'm not <laughs> counting them, Benji can. Benji's on retainer with Uno X, I think. He's been the Johannesson spokesperson, and I'm, nah, <laughs> I'm, I can't keep up the, the, um, the bit anymore. I, I think Johannesson's a good rider. Um, <laughs> <laughs> his Dauphiné was really good, and then Monfort too. Anyway, the Norwegian <laughs> discussions aside, great result for Lechnesson. He's very talented. He's, they have a lot of these very tall, slender Northern European GC guys. Aronsman's out the door, though. We'll see. Uh, can they keep Lechnesund after next year? I think they will want him to progress a little bit more and be getting into the top seven, top six of World Tour GC, uh, although this win is not a bad place mm -hmm. to start. Uh, Williams had the leader's jersey, and before we get into stage three, mention our show partner, Zwift. One of the most engaging parts of Zwift is the social aspect. I've tried other indoor training platforms for cycling without that element and it just doesn't work for me i can't keep doing it consistently whereas on zwift there's group rides meetups group workouts and lrcp zwift club you can join up at the link below to keep up to date with lrcp zwift rides or to hop on with myself or benji when we're on the bike and fancy a bit of company if you want to check out zwift you can go to zwift.com for a free seven-day trial and as i said head to the link in the description to join the lrcp swift club but tour de swift stage 377 k's long again a lot of climbs not all of them shallow 5.4 k's 8.6 percent is no easy feat in the middle very little flat although the lommersville climb 1.2 k 6.2 percent was 17 k's from the finish so it was a flat run and you just need to be fit uh, to uh, get to that finish. It finishes in Grenchen at 400 metres. That's where the velodrome is that the hour record attempts have been in recently. And we had a break. Gilbert, Bissiger, Quinn Simmons in some sort of jersey. I don't know which one it was. Uh, and the problem for them again, Benji, and I don't really understand what Gilbert was doing, uh, he was too close on GC, so they kept it really, really tight. Yes, certainly. By the way, uh, Simmons' uh, KOM jersey, I think he was on stage one in the breakaway, uh, okay. got KOM points there, so that's why he's wearing that. But you're right, he's really, he's really close in GC, so he's kind of ruining the break from the inside, and it really makes it difficult for this breakaway to make it deep into the final, because that peloton is not going to allow them to get that far. And what teams were controlling? Bike exchange, but I felt like, to me, it felt different between the Dauphin and Tour de Suisse. Like, when I look here, there's limited amount of riders that they use for Matthews, while at, at Grunewagen's, like, place in uh in the Dauphiné the entire team was working for him did you feel the same or 100% 100% agree with what you're saying the commitment seemed to be 
more like um, one of the teams at the Dauphiné that just offered one rider to maybe help. It was sort of we will contribute, whereas uh, the Dauphiné, it's like we're here for Dylan. We are going to make the race for Dylan. That's our A priority. And and it might be the horses too. They sent Grundle Janssen, Durbridge, or they, would they get around this course? They, they sent Schultz to Dauphiné, so maybe they don't have the horses here anyway for matthews maybe he's out of contract i don't know it's it's interesting uh bike exchange i think just signed another dutch sort of guy that uh, they've only got six guys on the star list too so they got bauer meyer and smith and house and to chase so yeah um interesting for green jersey and for the tour de france where matthews apparently is going as well as Groenewijk. interesting uh but yeah benji it's i think the biggest thing today was seeing total pacing and, like, they're not a stupid team. They just won two stages of the Dauphiné. That suggests, oh, did you think they would pace anyway, even if Sagan's condition was unknown? Oh, it's difficult, you know. We don't know what his condition was going to be after being out for so long, after having trouble with plenty of injuries, and now coming into this race, basically blind of, for us at least, of what his form was going to be. They probably had an idea of what his form was going to be. So... It's difficult for us to say, oh, it's weird that they're pacing or it's not weird that they're pacing. We don't know. It's unknown to us. But Total knew that something was uh, going on with Sagan in terms of having decent form, decent enough to get into the final. And I feel like I I felt that in, was it stage two as well, where we saw him towards the end of the final in the peloton as well. And I was like, oh, he looks pretty okay at the end of this race. And like in today's stage, then he looked to be pretty okay throughout the stage as well. So Total pacing, looking at how he looked in the race, was not necessarily a surprise, but it shows that they have confidence in him. Make sense? Yeah, definitely. And to be there at the finish, it's a difficult stage, as Benji said. And to remind you, last year, I can't remember whether it was Romandy or Swiss. I think it was Romandy, where yep. the stage Soler went on a flyer. That was a really hard stage. And he made a group of 20, which was mostly GC guys and climbers. Uh, and then, obviously, Soler went, so he didn't win the stage, but he was in that group uh, for the bunch sprint behind. I was like, whew climbing well and hopefully he's back in that condition anyway Bissigou goes clear Swiss rider drops your bear gets rid of them he got the most insane moto pull when he attacked literally dragged away from them the moto drafting has been bad here uh and it's been affecting races so much this year maybe we're more conscious of it or maybe it's just been bad like a lot of riders a lot of teams have been complaining to us not even and even admitting it when it's benefited them it's been bad uh, and today, Biscuit got dragged away. Then he went full threat of death on the descent, nearly crashed. He uh, just, like, there's a wide corner. He overbraked, had to reset, then railed it, didn't even go straight, which was crazy. Then there was another corner, <laughs> which was he went right to the edge of the grass. But this last little kick, kicker, the six percenter, it killed him. He doesn't climb as well as obviously the Peloton going full gas, Intermarche helping, bike exchange, Total uh, with Manzan pacing, and no Cofidis for Cocard. No Cofidis pacing, kind of surprising. Uh, but anyway, he was done for. And we got into the, the, the run into the finish. But before then, Benji, were you surprised to see Thomas going for bonus seconds, not Pidcock, not Martinez? Well, after they won, they can't really go for Martinez for the bonus seconds, or at least they might have given up already on Martinez when it comes to the bonus seconds. He's lost, what was it, 51 seconds in stage one. It's pretty significant in a seven-week, a seven-day stage race. Seven weeks would be a bit long for a stage race, but um, Thomas got that lead out of the intermediate sprint. He got those points and had one challenger, basically, those bonus seconds, and it was uh, Shockman that was challenging him, and nobody else really seemed to care, so the other Ineos wider was getting the third spot anyway, but it doesn't really surprise me that Thomas takes it. He's got a better sprint when it comes to like an intermediate sprint, in my opinion, especially when it's like a 1v1, for example, like compared to like an Adam Yates. And then when we see Adam Yates, I'm also not really seeing the person that is going to hunt for bonus seconds at, at Gates like this. So I'd argue from the two riders they have up there in GC, he was the more likely candidate to go for this. And perhaps they don't want to risk losing time in the upcoming stage with Yates just because he spent energy on an intermediate sprint somewhere. Make sense or not? It could also be that Thomas is trolling. It's certainly possible. He let out Pidcock <laughs> at the end of this stage. He also, when they were clear with Shackman, said to Shackman, do you want to go? Like, you want to have a go? We'll keep going with it. And Shackman was like, you're, you're crazy. Although he tried to 
fist bump Thomas and Thomas like Roglic with Jonas and the Dauphiné finish was really reluctant to take both hands off the bars, which I kind of understand. Anyway, we get into the finish, a lot of uh, road furniture in the middle of the road, the peloton splitting, unsplitting, splitting, coming back together constantly, six, seven, eight times. I, I'm feeling a crash coming and it did happen. It was when DSM, they took it up very, very, very early on the lead out once again. It's like there's the Israel one at two gates and then DSM, like, let's start at seven with four guys. <laughs> like, if we all just do two kilometers on the front each, we will win. Um, they did that. And yeah, Lechnerson pulled off and he was sliding back. And it was just the overhead. I haven't seen the replay. They didn't really show it. Uh, I assume they showed it now, but they didn't show it for ages. Uh, he was sliding back and crashed and took out half the quick step team. And I can't attribute blame anywhere without watching another replay, but it was just off screen. And we were looking, is Remco there? Is Remco there? And this was outside of the three kilometers to go. And the man who just contested the intermediate sprint, Shackman, uh, was caught up in it. So his GC looking a bit dicey. If I look at how much time he lost today, it was 53 seconds. So he's shuffled back in the Martinez territory. Uh, Avon Apol just checking, according to first cycling, didn't lose any time. But yeah, that's... Did you see Quick Quickstep were very anonymous, Benji, as well. Did you notice? Like, they were not moving to the front with Martinez train on one side of the other GC guys. Yeah, it felt it felt that way. Perhaps it's because they weren't necessarily trying to get themselves at the front in a safe position that they ended up in this crash. But Ilan van Welder, I'm pretty sure, was down. Osgain, I'm pretty sure, was down. A domestique as well. So those are three riders that are down. That's going to affect the upcoming stage. Osgain looked pretty banged up after the stage. So I'm wondering, like, Osgain's been talking about the yellow jersey in Copenhagen, for example, and I've always found that it was a, a bit of a difficult goal for him to take on that initial uh, initial time trial prologue thingy but this is definitely going to probably affect their his like first few days there like depending on how he gets out of the crash like this but they all finished i'm pretty sure although Elon yeah, on was sitting minutes. there oh, okay okay perfect and um yeah when it comes to the rest of the crash it's outside of the three kilometers like you mentioned so in total this is not going to be a, a great thing for shockman's gc but yeah i'm not sure i would have uh, calculated that in myself in the first place uh, yeah, I think both of us think Vlasov's the man for them here anyway. Anyway, it goes into the finish. Very, very technical, like multiple turns. There's two 90-degree left-handers uh, with, I think, 600 and then 250, 300 to go. Sagan is lined up. You see him fighting with Arndt, boxing off on Christoph's wheel. Pascalon is giving a lead out to Christoph. Christoph was very fast in the Norway final stage. They get to the second last corner. Christoph loses the wheel of Pascalon into the corner not intentionally, a handling issue, and quite a few bike lengths he was off. And he r goes back to Pascalon's wheel. And this corner is so tight that it's just Sagan behind him. And Sagan would have had an incredibly difficult decision to make if he wanted to close that Pascalon wheel. Anyway, Christoph closes it himself. There must be an energy cost there. Peacock's contesting the sprint. Cockard is shuffled back. Next corner, Pascalon again. Great lead out from him. He's going, he's going, he's decelerating. And we see Christoph out of his wheel. Doesn't jump. Just doesn't jump, and Sagan gets the jump on him from third wheel over the top. He then goes in front of Christoph, closes to the barriers, but is clear of him, so there's no issue rules-wise, and then goes back to the center. Christoph is really struggling to seem to get up to speed and just never does with Sagan winning the stage. Cockard coming late, but very fast, but he was in the draft the whole time. Second, Christoph ending third, Pidcock fourth, Aaron Baru fifth. He's showing signs of life. Trenton sixth, Bowles seventh, Matthews eighth, and Turnison ninth, Betiol tenth. So GC, no changes except for Krohn moving into second, Lechnerson third, and Thomas with the bonus seconds up to fourth, but it's Williams still in the leaders' jersey. But most impressive things against on a total jersey, Benji, by an order of magnitude. Yes, certainly. But looking deeper into the Sagan victory, I do want to mention, I think positioning played a big role in that final. Being able to get to that point where he's in a position has always been Sagan's specialty. He's been able to like worm himself through lead-ups to his sprint and so forth. But in that final corner, like you mentioned, the Pasqualon move, Kristoff closes that. Being able to be in that Kristoff wheel, that's the perfect wheel to be in because Sagan is the kind of rider that has that acceleration over a rider like Kristoff. So in all honesty, but different sprinters there that are uh, sprinters with more acceleration in the position of like Kristoff, I think that Sagan's going to have a harder time winning this 
scenario that plays out. But his acceleration of Sagan versus Kristaps is just magnitudes different on paper. So when I saw them going into the final like that, I was pretty certain that Sagan was going to win from that point onwards. At what point during this final were you like, Sagan has a chance of winning this? Uh, when he was on fourth wheel about 1,700 meters to go because it still requires a lot of fitness to be there and to maintain that position. And yeah, he. I think I was like, he's at least going to top three, top four this because out of these corners, if you're in, the, like we showed with Kokard's position, it doesn't matter how fast your sprint is. If you're, if you're sixth, seventh wheel, you can't do too much. It's narrow. And I also think Christoph both the climbs and then I do think closing Pascal on cost him a little bit. Uh, maybe not enough to, to win, but you never know. Um, I think, yeah, and it's a mistake, obviously, in hindsight, if he'd won the sprint easily. <laughs> it's not a mistake, but it looks, yeah, Sagan looks good. It's a typical Sagan win. He's won at Tour de Swiss like a million times. Having seen Sagan do this right now, does this change your mind on the Tour de France, for example? Do you think that Sagan has a bid for the green jersey now after winning the stage at the Tour de Swiss? Yes, for two reasons. Firstly, uh, this is an indication. Like, this is the level he showed at Swiss or Romandy last year, uh, for starters. Second of all, the Tour de France green jersey competition is heavily favoured towards Sagan as compared to last year. Last year, we had an inordinate amount of pure sprint stages and few mixed stages where there was large points on offer this year in the green jersey competition there's if you look at the rule book which was uh sent out by aso a week or so ago there's like full full points for legit uphill finishes uh the lausanne finish the long we finish uh the saint etienne carcassonne all 50 pointers that's more than the sprint stages we might have. There might only be one sprint stage in Denmark and the other, I mean, big bunch sprint. The other could be destroyed by crosswinds. Aremberg is 50 points. That might not be a bunch sprint. Calais, who knows in those messy northern French stages. So like for the Ewans, Jakobsons, that's difficult. And it's against the master of intermediate sprints. And if he's climbing well, that's almost to me more important because the difference between Fourth, uh, I don't think he's going to T3 bunch the pure bunch sprints consistently. But from T4 to T8 is actually not that much difference. And so if he's just, he can come eighth. I think Sagan Benji can average eighth or seventh in the bunch sprints in this form. And then if he's getting embraced consistently, that's a real green jersey threat. I think so as well. And it's weird because like having fought through the green jersey points in previous days, you, you would think... Okay, Sagan was not on my mind yet. And now this one through the Swiss stage is impacting that a lot because I'm instantly thinking, okay, how dangerous is this man to the likes of a Philipson, for example, who will go for it for Alperson, the likes of a Wout Fanat, who will go for it for Jumbo. Like, does he play a role in that battle? And I think those teams will probably think to themselves, well, okay, perhaps we need to consider Sagan as well now as a competitor again after being out for so long when it comes to his injuries and so forth, you know? Maybe. What did he do? Unbound gravel and going to Utah is now the best ever preparation <laughs> for <laughs> European racing. I heard someone said it yeah, in my Discord. I'm not sure if it's true or not. I think it is. Apparently at Unbound or whatever, at the events again, like just went off from the gun for like 30 minutes, full gas, split the group, and then stopped at a rest station for like half an hour afterwards, <laughs> which is like full troll mode. The Joker. Is his nickname. But sorry, back to Green Jersey. Yes. Like his name hasn't left my lips for a long time because he's had injuries, COVID like three times, and whatever other issues, but got good equipment. Total energy seemed quite competent, or at least trending in the right direction. This will, of course, and the at other advantages, Benji. Wow, why not? Yumbo have got split priority priorities. Sagan, Green, that's why they signed him. Like he has, I don't know if he's going Turgis, Os, Bodner. Anytime he says, let's light this up, this this rolling climb to go for the intermediate sprint, he has five guys to do it. That's also an advantage. Wow, you are forgetting the myth, the man, the legend, Pierre Latour, my man. Come on, who has to set up his attacks on the second last climb? I mean, Jumbo Visma, 
He will try. <laughs> They'll be pacing, you know, or UAE. Pagacha will be attack or pacing his, t- his teammates at six watts per kilo and 10 minutes in, Latour will attack. And they'll be like, what are you doing, Pierre? Um, <laughs> we'll wait for that to happen. But, yeah, Sagan, green jersey. I mean, this also, I mean, our, our clip of uh, Froome, is Froome back? That one didn't, hey, that one, the lifespan of that, <laughs> it wasn't very long. So we've seen one tour to Swiss stage and now we're saying he's back for the green jersey. Maybe it's more hope because if you're a, I mean, you might not like Sagan's sort of, I think he's a little bit dirty in sprints, et cetera, that's fine. But you have to accept that the commercial reality, particularly for people like us in the media side of things, is he's good for business. He's well known, particularly in English speaking countries. And I think it's good for the Tour de France. It's good for total energy. And it's like, Benji, when we see these guys go to different teams like Froome, I don't take any joy in Froome being bad. Like when I'm like, he's on an overpaid contract. Like I want Sagan to do well. I agree. I agree to that aspect. But the difference between Froome and Sagan is that Sagan hasn't blocked me on Twitter yet. So I've got more hope for his career at the moment. Oh, maybe we can change that at some point. But yeah. Good to see. Hopefully he continues on with it. Tomorrow's stage, stage four from Grenchen to Brunnen. It's an it's another one of these stages. It's the same stage. 192Ks, 3.8K, 7.6% climb, cresting 16Ks from the finish with a descent than a, a sprint run-in, a flat run-in. There's less climbing throughout the stage, so it's either a break if it's strong enough, or it's going to be reduced by a sprint. We'll see who gets dropped. It's the same stage. Again, uh, if if Sagan doubles up, I'll be very, very impressed. Bike Exchange should surely try for Matthews, but maybe we'll see a break as well. Um, But yeah, that's all. Any other thoughts from Tour de Suisse, Benji, before we quickly go to Ventoux? I'm going to quickly say that Sagan is going to double up, and he's going to do so, and then Betiol will will get second and start celebrating for second again for the second time this Tour de Suisse, because why not? Yeah, that was pretty funny uh, yesterday in stage two. I forgot to mention Betty. Oh, yeah, thought he'd won. Uh, obviously, didn't know there was a rider up the road. And Wow Fun Art said on Twitter, I'm happy to pass the bad celebration torch to you. I would say Wout's is still worse because Betty O's is just embarrassing. It didn't potentially cost him the win. So oh. not sure any torch has been passed. I disagree. Completely disagree. No the Betty one is so much worse because he should know that there's someone ahead. Yeah, but like, what's the cost? Trenton just clowning him? Yeah, that's like much bigger than the <laughs> clowning of Wout van Aert because he like celebrated two seconds too early instead of like 50 seconds too late. Yeah, maybe. We'll see. I'll ask. We'll, we'll try and ask them or maybe we'll put a poll out at some point on our LCP Twitter account, which you should follow. Anyway, speaking of EF and not clowning, Mont Blanc 2 <laughs> Challenge was today. It's a 1-1 race. I think it's trying to go up to World Tour. Definitely, it's trying to go up to 1.0 Pro. It's 1-1 for now, so only 125 points on offer. It is very, very difficult. They do Von 2 twice. 24K, 25K is 5%, and then uh, from one side, the shallower side, and then they do the other side, which I'm just looking for the exact thing. 20Ks at 8%. So it ain't a joke. It's a hard stage. Lopez did a ridiculous time last year, and the start list here was extremely strong because everyone's hunting points. But now that everyone's hunting points, these 1 1 races are becoming harder and harder to get points at. We've got Stora here. Uh, Valverde is sent here with Sosa and Verona. Verona just off winning that Dauphine Mountain stage. And I'll discuss it in a second after the start list. But yeah, the prudence of sending undercooked riders to these races, not sure there it is. Uh, Coffert has got Guillaume Martin, the points man. Israel sent Woods. Uh, who else do we have? Christian Rodriguez for Total Energy. Tobias Johannesson here, who's decent in the Dauphiné. Uh, Simon Carr, Esteban Chavez, Guerrero, Steinhauser. So strong teams. Anyway, EF ended up going 1-2, collecting 210 points, with the, which is big for them. It's why they turned up. And also, more importantly, they won. Um, and Guerrero is looking very, very good. And it's not surprising that he's carried this form from the Dauphiné. Um, but what do you – you mentioned, Benji, that you think he can win a Tour de France stage. His watts are good. The watts are really, really good, but it is a one-day race. I think that's right. I think if you're seventh up there or like fifth on that Soleil stage in GC, uh, the GC guys in the Dauphiné, that is good enough to win a tour stage from the break. I truly believe so as well. And he's got that finishing kick as well. I think he was third or fourth on that. Fourth on that Dauphiné stage that Gaudu ended up uh, clowning Wout Fanard at. Yep. And that's a sign of being good at that, 
those kind of races that a kind of finish even if it comes down to a group sprint after a harder stage you can make it happen a punchy sprint for example but also throughout the season he's been a bit scarred by crashes and so forth and bad luck because top 20 at Basque Country is pretty damn difficult 15 on Arate for example but UAE Tour he actually punctured at the foot of the Jebel Hafid climb and still got 21st in GC otherwise he would have gotten a top 15 in GC so it looks like he's becoming a better climber and the only thing I fear is that what if he gets chained by, I don't know, Rigoberto Uran or Chavez in GC? No, nah, no, nah, EF never do that. No, nah, they won't okay. do that. 100% he'll okay. get freedom uh, to go for stages, which is good. That's a positive thing that team has always or pretty much done for the last few years. Uh, but I would say we have seen this. We've seen it in Estonia. Bike Exchange went there and did not get the hall of points they expected. Valverde was sent very late notice to this race, according to Unzue. Called him up and said, can you do it? And I think I think these teams, and particularly the teams who haven't been sending or focusing on these races, like Arkea, they don't realize that you, you can't just turn up and come forth. Like, it's still a tough competition. This is a 1-1 race. Guys doing 5.8 watts per kilo for the best part of an hour after doing a rep of on two before. And Valverde ended up coming, where did he come? Maybe he's just helping Carlos, I don't know. He came 21st with like three points. Uh, Sosa as well, 56. That's really poor, actually, uh, from him. But yeah, it's it's not as easy as just turning up. Like, especially if you're panicking, you're not giving guys notice to actually train and prepare for these events. And that's the difference. Okay, prepare for Trobro Leon and then slap it. Um, which, I mean, there's a debate to be had about whether that's appropriate or not. Uh, but yeah, that's just another thing to monitor. Israel and EF looking good, Benji. Like, where's your gut feeling now? If you want to check out the full article on lanternrich.com.au, we posted it yesterday, Raul's article about all the points, etc. But I was worried about EF. They seem to be turning a corner now, just like last year. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that Israel is still in trouble, though, despite them having better days. I feel like, wasn't Woods also at this race at Mont, uh, Mont Ventoux stage? He got 37th. Yep. That's not a good result. Guy Niv is the best rider, I think, on the Israel team there. So a good performance by that guy, to be honest, getting 14th on five minutes still, but still. And he would have liked a better result here as well. I'm pretty sure he's skipping probably to the Swiss uh, because to the Swiss is on the same day. So he's pretty. Sure, I'm pretty sure he's skipping to the Swiss. <laughs> but um, like They requested a last-minute invite, I'm pretty yeah. sure, maybe either to this or Occitanie. So again, okay. has he been given notice to prepare for this? I, I would have expected Woods to be better at this. I think so as well. And it doesn't look like he had a good day today, as simple as that. And perhaps it's that he noticed early on that it wouldn't be as good day. So he saved energy in this stage. But we'd expect more from a rider like him here. And I don't know, Israel, they're also pretty uh, pretty much on a distance now when it comes to the points. And I'm kind of in the doubt of whether they can catch up again. But Lotto was far down at some yeah, point this year. Things can change and they were able but do they have an Arnold Elite that can carry Israel out of that spot? And that's the thing where I'm like, I don't think so. They need Woods to be on. They need Full Sang to top five Swiss here. They need Nitzolo to be cleaning. He has come back and he scored quite a few points in the Belgian one days recently. Uh, they more, Most importantly, most, most importantly, it's not even about the talent. It's is the team sending the guys to the races? And all of them pretty much are now. EF even are seem to be maybe a little bit races they didn't always go to israel 100 percent are but now it's harder and lotto started this focusing on it from january and other teams have slowly like mother stopping like oh shit there's a relegation issue <laughs> like six months into the third year of the triennium ranking and they're like this is unfair it's like yeah the points distribution has its problems but you're incompetent so my sympathies are limited for you. Um, like you shouldn't have a problem staying up if you're those sort of teams. But yeah, it's just something to watch. I'm a bit obsessed, obviously, with the relegation thing, just because something different. It gives meaning to these other races more than you know. Obviously, wins are important, but some of the one-one races, it just adds a little bit of meaning to them, which I guess is the whole point of the system. Um, but yeah, I think Arno Deli we mentioned has been doing really, really well. Other thing to mention is Baby Jira before we get out of here. There's no coverage. I haven't been following it that closely. But just to say, Leo Hayter, brother, obviously, younger brother of Ethan Hayter, was dropped on. The, there's a 
stage yesterday, which is just ridiculous. Like they don't even have them in the real Giro <laughs> anymore, <laughs> um, except Africa, which is harder than any stage in 2021 Giro. And Leo Hader got dropped by Lenny Martinez, who's a pocket climber, French climber, and then was two minutes behind, came back, then put like five minutes into him on a false slide uphill. So looks pretty good. He won Liège or Lombardia U23, Liège U23 maybe. Yep. yep. Um, what do you see as his profile? Would you? What team or role would you sign him for? Well, he's certainly a, a damn good climber looking at the uh, the stuff he's done this week. Like, he won stage two as well, stage three being that huge mountain stage. But every single time I talk to this guy, he responds in like, I wasn't even supposed to be at this race. <laughs> like, twice already that happened. And yeah. I'm like, really? Because <laughs> you're damn good at it. Like, if that's true, then then what are these other people doing in the race? Because they're also talented riders. Romain Gregoire is pretty talented, although I'd argue he's more a punchy type than Leo Hayter. Leo Hayter seems to be able to be punchy, but mainly the climbing aspect as well. Lenny Martinez seems to be more the climby type without a necessary like hardcore punch at the end of a race. So those two riders are really talented at the moment and showing it in these races. And I'm just looking forward to see what the rest of this uh, race has to offer. But when it comes to Leo Hayter signing somewhere, it's... Like, the most likely scenario is going to Ineos, you know? Because, like, on paper, Ethan Hater, Leo Hater, combining them, unless Ethan Hater ends up leaving Ineos, which is also a possibility because he runs out of a contract, I think, at the yep, end of the year. he's out of contract. Do you see it happening, though? Uh, they gave a lot of money, it seems, big contract to Pidcock. Hater said he's not a sprinter, didn't look good in the classics, didn't win a Dauphiné sprint. He won a Romandie couple of sprints, positioning issues. I don't know. I'll reserve judgment on that one for another day. I would give a note of caution regarding Baby Giro. Note of caution. The organizers, they probably thought they banned all the British riders. They just banned Trinity. They banned, I think, the Colombians, or not banned. They prevented them from racing, didn't give invites because they were winning everything. They they didn't invite Trinity, which I think is a, a disgrace, frankly. Yeah. Uh, we have in the calendar, are these riders peaking for it? Gregoire's. He's had 10, 12 days between Alpes Césaire's tour and this and another 17 days before that where he did uh, Flesh Ardennes, which he won. Like, are they really preparing for the baby Giro or is Lavenir the one where we will see these guys properly locked in? And I would say that Lavenir is much more indicative of a rider's potential than baby Giro, I think. Yeah. Ardilla on UAE, is, is, is he win baby Giro? Uh, I think he won it or got second at some point. I don't know if it was first or second, but it was close. And then he pretty much did nothing at, at UAE. And it seems like he's the likely candidate to leave that team if he hasn't already. Is he still there? He's got another year know. contract. He got a four-year oh. deal. So he won Baby Giro in 2019 and he got dropped under Dauphiné break at the base of Croix de la Fer or Colombia two days ago So by Armour Rail. So yeah, it's not... It's not the be-all and end-all baby Giro, and I would say the organizers not allowing the strongest teams to turn up makes it even more difficult to properly assess talent, although, of course, you have power data. But that's all from us today. A bit of a longer one because we wanted to recap all the action that we missed yesterday. We hope you enjoyed it. We'll be back tomorrow for another Climby Sprinty Boy stage in Tour de Suisse. And other than that, thanks to Zwift for supporting the podcast, and we'll see you then. Ciao.